workshop got divided into upriver and downriver at one point. And now that Kalitz is gone, there's less upriver. Like Deerdick, Mikey Taylor, Barra is so upriver. What does that mean? They're upriver. They're like, you know, they're where the... You know, where TVs exist, the internet, fishing's better. I could see where like it seemed like if, if Kalis felt that way, which I, I feel like he did, that he, didn't, he felt like he didn't fit in. First of all, I can't be mad at anything Fat Bill said, because Fat Bill is my homie. And like, he can fucking call me a piece of shit jerk off, and I'm not going to give a shit because he's Fat Bill. You know what I mean? He's my favorite filmer to film with. I fucking love Bill. Dill, on the other hand, it really bummed me out. It was like a lack of respect. It was like, who the fuck are you to talk about me and one, Dylan's thing, you know? And two, call me up river. I mean, my thing is, is like, hey man, I'm about as street as you get, you know what I'm saying? Welcome back to Epically Latered. Uh, this episode's about Josh Kalis. This episode kind of came to be because of the Dylan Reader episode. Dill said some stuff and Kalis didn't, didn't like it or, you know, he called me and was like bummed and kind of wanted to set the record straight. He's like, I got stories. I was in an insane asylum. I did this, I did that. I was like, all right, this is gonna be awesome. So I first started hearing of him in time code. I really remember him doing kickflip backside nose blunt slides, and I think I shot a photo of him do one. I just used to think of backside tricks, like backside nose blunt slides and backside tail slides, and crooked hat, like all the way crooked, and like earrings and like dirt stash. So I met up with Kalis and talked about skating. We talked about Lenny Kirk, Deerdick, Stevie, Philly, Chicago, Texas, all this stuff. So it's cool to interview someone that's such like a, a Kind of a skate rat, like he's like diehard skater and just go through like skate history. I don't know, I'm really excited about this episode. Uh, so here it is, Josh Kalis episode. What do you think would be the best zone? This is good right here. These big ass SoCal houses don't even have lights in the ceiling anywhere. Actually, before I skated, my biggest thing was um, roller skating. I was like this big speed skater kid, you know? Well, what killed my roller skating was is I had lied to the cops. Well, I used to go roller skating every weekend, but then I lied to the cops about getting kidnapped or not getting kidnapped, but like I told them that this kidnapper was out like trying to get me, you know? It was like the big thing in school was this kidnapper. So I lied and said that I met the dude and they broke me down in the cop shop. I mean, they, have, they broke me down. I was tearing, I told them I was full of shit, so my dad, grounded me from my roller skates for like six months and it was like that was it no I didn't even give a shit about it anymore going way back to my first days of skating it was it was the Bones Brigade uh, Steve Caballero was probably like my favorite dude out of all of them I don't remember what Powell video it was but it was Caballero and Tommy Guerrero and all those dudes were skating outside like uh, there was like a neighborhood and uh, that's what I kept watching I the vert stuff and none of that, I didn't even pay attention to it. I just would rewind and fast forward, and I think that's what got me right there. You know? Do some tricks, man. I first met Josh, I lived in Lansing, Michigan. We just kind of knew one another through skating. He knew that I shot photos, so come down to Grand Rapids and shoot photos with him. It's funny, he got grounded. His dad, like, he stole a bunch of baseball cards and shit of his dad's, and he got grounded for hell long. I don't even know how long. But he lied and told his dad that I work for Transworld. So his dad would, like, let him go out and, and shoot photos with me. He thought that I was, like, some magazine photographer, and I could, I barely know how to use a camera, you know? But I was just kind of learning how, and it's sort of ironic that he's, like, one of the dudes that I learned how to shoot skate photos of. But that's, like, what he looked like. But it's hella funny. Josh? Yeah, that's Josh. And... 1989, so it's 21 years ago. It's great. <laughs> it makes me feel hella old thinking about how long ago that was, but yeah. That was the skate rat Josh. And then I met like the Josh with whose earrings and fucking pot leaf and like the thugged out Josh in SF. About <laughs> four years later. 
And you saw Sheffy then too, right? Back when I lived in Michigan, yeah. Like, he was the Sheffy, the big hair, you know, Sheffy from the videos and stuff. It was sick. I remember he was just hauling ass, like going as fast as you possibly could. Yeah, it's insane. Like, crazy. Like, how much power he had and how fast he went. And, like, that was the raddest thing, you know, like about watching him skate in person. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, he was a pretty main dude. It just so happened that he lived in Grand Rapids. I'll show you the three raddest skateboarders that I know. The vegetarian powers. Sean Sheffy. By far the raddest, craziest, gnarliest skateboarder. And it was like this myth, urban legend. And uh, it wasn't until like a year after that that I was downtown. We were, we were maybe 50, 15 grinding curbs trying to do that shit. This dude with this big ass fro just comes through and back lips one of the full size benches. Our jaws hit the ground and we were like, Sean Chef, holy shit, man. It's definitely like seeing like a legend, you know? Well, one of the cool things about skating with him back then was like, you didn't want to sit down. Like, he gave you that, like, that vibe and that energy where, like, if he was skating the five stairs, like, he wanted you to skate with him. I swear to God, I learned more tricks that day just skating with that dude than I ever have, even still to this day. And he would just pow, bounce to the next spot and everybody's trying to keep up with him, you know what I mean? It, it was sick, dude. Here. What up? Ever since I met him that day, that was like my drive to want to skate and always skate and like just chef it, dude. The illest dude ever, ever. Does he remember you from then? I, you have to ask him. You know, I've never asked him. I always played it cool. Like, that's Sean, you know what I mean? I, I ain't fucking with that dude. There's a lot of skate history in here. You know, we'd like to say what's up to the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> I was a 17. I remember us going by your house once. Oh my I, uh, God, that's the story. Over there. And this elementary school where they used to yeah. skate with the yellow curve to remember yeah. that yeah oh, i can't believe this dude remembers yeah. it man yeah yeah i was grounded i was grounded in my room and it must have been for like i think three or four weeks i can't believe this story man my dad comes to my room knocking on the door and he's like hey there's some guys out in the driveway and i was like what so i went out there and i looked and it was ted lee yeah and Sheffy. and myself tooling around in my driveway, trying to see if I could skate. <laughs> Ted Lee. And I was like, oh my God, because this was, this was like after I had started seeing them downtown, you know? And my dad let me off grounding to go skate with these dudes for a while. He let me off, I couldn't believe it, man. That was like the best day in my entire life. Oh, wow, he yeah. let you out of, yeah, that's intense, cool. Yeah, that was pretty insane, man. Damn, you remember that shit. Yeah. Hey, film Josh. Uh, must work for you, go ahead. <laughs> He's gonna follow me. Do you, what do you remember about Josh? Very already mature skater and sharp when we first met him and he was already known around his city and you know state as being a sharp and clean skater. So I was pretty impressed when I first met him. Yeah. Shit. That's only because like I was out with the big dogs and I, I was trying my hardest to <laughs> to like you know just yeah. do my thing. I didn't want to look like no punk out there. Yeah. <laughs> Great experience to see how far he's came with his skateboarding and progressed and the technicality of it. I'm very proud to have been a part of that. I've always loved like Matt Hensley skating. He was like a huge one for me. But I think my early days of like learning how to kickflip and how I want to skate is directly related to Sean skating and that influence he gave me like live. You know, the downtown, our little city wasn't that big, but it was like, we didn't want to skate anything else besides downtown after we seen Sean down there, you know? And what are you, your sign? Taurus. Taurus. Well, that bull-headed and strong yeah, like one you are, man. Mr. Kalis. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that. <laughs> pretty cool, yeah, pretty cool. Strong sign.
My pops was moving from Michigan to Dallas, Texas. And uh, they didn't want me to be part of the move because I was a bit of a like troublemaker. So him and my mom, who lived in New York at the time, sent me to skateboard camp at Woodward. And it was there that I met Tony Mag and filmed a couple things while at Woodward. And then he was like, hey, we're gonna put you on 8th Street. And that was it. Dude, I was super psyched, you know? I mean, I was hyped to get on, but at the same time, it was like all my favorite skaters, Mike Carroll and Sean Sheffy and Sal Barbier and like all the illest dudes rode for 8th Street. And they all left right as I got on. So I was kind of like, well, I don't know. I didn't really give a shit, man. I was getting free H street boards, you know what I mean? Like, that was tight. At some point, my mom moved from New York to Philly, and when I would visit her, I would go skate the city. And this was before, like, me and Stevie really, like, we were just little skater dudes. Oh, man. The first time I met Josh, I was with my cousin, Rasul, and my man, Terrence. And uh, we were skating this, this, this skate spot called Rat Curbs. And um, Bam Margera and Mike Malinato used to skate for A Street back in the day. They showed up, it was like Mike, Bam, Bam's brother, Bam's dad, and Josh. And they introduced us like, yo, this is Josh. He's from outside of Philly. He skates for A Street. We like, what? That's dope. And he was good. But we never, I never really tripped off of it until he came to love and started skating. And that's when I seen him skate. I was like, damn, that dude is sick. And for some reason, me and him just like hit it off. Like I was good and he was good, but I never even heard of him before though. I was probably like 11 years old, yeah. What would you call this? Shrine. shrine. Yeah, my love shrine. Does it look like a shrine? It does, huh? Damn. I wasn't really going for the shrine look. We skated together all the time and we just clicked at love. Coming downtown, it was like looking forward to seeing Josh. That, that made me want to get sponsored, and he was already sponsored, so he would just give us boards, wheels, and one day we was skating, and I learned kickflip nose slides, and then he learned kickflip nose slides, then he learned kickflip nose slides, not only hill flip. He had every trick. He could, do, he could do everything. I don't know how Josh came. Like I don't know if it was a relative, or, but yeah, he came, and he, he was really good, man. He was really good. You know, I wish dudes like that would skate our way too. There still wasn't anybody who was exploring the city like we always did. Top of the food chain in Philly was Ricky. Uh, it was definitely like hierarchy shit. Because Ricky had rules where you couldn't film unless you were pushing switch, switch, you know? Like if you're doing switch mongo, you ain't fucking filming it at love. You know, that's when Ricky and those dudes ran love. And they had like their rules and they, they had their whole thing, you know what I'm saying? At the time, the very first Trans World article on Philadelphia was there then. And a few of us shot some stuff. And like it was told, don't use that shit. DGK didn't exist for a while. And then he turned that other side of Love Park into DGK, the Dirty Ghetto Kids. And it was because of that. At that time, it was two different cliques. It was like our clique, like kind of the DGK clique. And then it was like Ricky Oyola and all of those dudes. I don't think a lot of those dudes, like DGK dudes, I don't think they liked the fact that Matt and I were the ones who were most known and Philadelphia was like kind of ours. We created that, you know what I mean? We created that, so it was kind of ours in such a way. Whoever came to Philly was supposed to hang with Ricky and Matt and all of them dudes. And see, Fred Gall, when he came, he didn't come and hang with us. He went and hang with Ricky. And Josh was never that dude. Josh was like... He took the us, so every time he came to the city, he came over and chilled with us. <laughs> he always had the swag, but he wasn't the white dude that tried to act black. He was just like the white dude with swag. Everybody liked him from white people to black people. The girls loved him. Like He was Josh. Everybody knew he had value. No matter what city he was in, he brought value to that city. At the end of the day, he was taking all they shine. You know, and Ricky was supposed to be the king of Philly, and you got all of these dudes following his lead and shit, and then here come Josh. That's like, I'm not following your lead, I'm actually rocking with the, the ghetto kids, and they definitely didn't like that shit. Like, me and Ricky got along pretty good until he thought I fucked his ex-chick. And then 
that started up a whole fucking shitstorm of beef between me and Ricky. And uh, that carried to San Francisco. I mean, it carried all over the place. We had, like, crazy beef. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there were some issues and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, um, some just stupid shit that went down. I think just that situation was easier for Ricky to say, fuck you, Josh, get out of my city. And Josh left. It wasn't like, we gonna retaliate. Josh just left. And I was like, damn. They're gonna town hero, our dude. They're gonna free boards. Like, it was over. Rumors were, like, I wasn't allowed there. And I went back on that Invisible tour and was like, hey, bro, here I am. And Ricky was like, you know what? You're going to be pro. I'm pro. We shouldn't just fucking be at each other's throat every time. So just respect. If I'm here, don't be here. If you're here, like, I ain't coming in. And we just kind of rode it out like that for a while until when I moved back to Philly, then... We kind of squashed it. And Ricky found out I didn't fuck the chick and apologized, and it was all good. Look, I'm older now, and I just thought back. So it was always kind of like this fake beef, because there really wasn't any beef. You know what I mean? Like, it, there wasn't any. We're two different people. I'm from the woods. They're from the city. Skating was like something that we had in common, but the, we didn't skate the same way. You know what I mean? And Love Park kind of, like, was their playground that hooked them up, got them on D.C., and, and look where they're at now. Just his tray flips, man. I mean, tray flips are my favorite trick, and he's seriously got tops. I mean, he's got one of the best ones ever. To tell you the truth, Stevie's got an awesome. Stevie's got a great switch flip. He's just really good. Like Josh's style is what I like more than anything. Um, you know, his big spins, the tail slides. I wish I could do that shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to spend two years trying to do it once. <laughs> that's gonna be a shitty two years of my skating. I might do it, but that's no fun. Josh's personality back then, you know, he was like, he was a, t you could tell he had, came from like a tough background, you know, he had a lot of, a lot of like, you know, tough family issues that he dealt with and uh, he had a funny way of just like telling stories about like his past and stuff. And I didn't know whether to believe him or not. When I went to live back with my dad in Dallas, we didn't get along at all. I was doing my thing in the city of Dallas, hanging out with these dudes who were like, not necessarily like gangsters, but kind of but they were skaters, and I fell right into that mix. Around that time, I got locked up in this mental institution for like six or seven months. I got caught stealing, and they took me to jail for stealing, and I was in there for like two days, and uh, this bounty hunter dude, like dude in a full suit, and he was almost albino, took me out of the jail. He pulls out a nine millimeter, and he says, hey, State of Texas says I can do anything in my power to keep you from running, so don't run. It's like, all right. So on the way down there, he had me filling out all these like crazy psych forms, you know, like do you study license plates and just crazy questions. So I got put in this institution where there was all these uh, murderers who got out on whatever they were like, fucked up in the brain. So instead of going to prison, they went here. Uh, no shoestrings, no belts, uh, big magnet locks on the doors, they'd take my blood every couple days. And I would go into these counseling sessions and they'd be like, so what are you doing here? Johnny, Timmy, they all killed somebody, he raped four girls, like blah, blah, blah. And they'd come to me and I'd be like, I don't fucking know, you guys are all fucking psycho. One day I ran out of toilet paper and you walk up to the lady, she had to like go back into the closet. So when she went back in the closet, her little desk phone, I picked it up, hit nine and dialed my mom. My mom answered, screaming at me, uh, I told her I was in Salt Lake City at some place and I ended up waking up in a closet from, they hit me from behind with some drugs. So whatever, you move forward and um, Bounty Hunter came, scooped me up, says, all right, you're on a plane back to Dallas. And he says that what it was was my dad did it. Like he thought I was this like fucked up kid and he hired this dude to get me and then his insurance company paid for it. And shit, I'd have been in there six years, you know, but I got out in six months. And when I got out, 
the A Street thing just wasn't even an option for me, you know? The girl I would call to get the boxes and all that stuff, when I called her, she was like, yeah, you know, Tony said, no, Josh is, he's out. So skating was almost done for me, you know? I didn't give a shit, dude. Like, I didn't have a board, I didn't have none of that, and I didn't care. I got back with my homies, I told my dad, fuck him, like, fuck you, I know the whole story, I don't have nothing to do with you anymore. Um, and I went to Dallas, and I just hung out with my friends, and we, we lived um, in North Dallas, just hood. I mean, it was cockroaches and gangsters, and I mean, it was crazy. And it wasn't until, like, I heard these rumors that Jamie Thomas was coming in to Dallas. Should I ain't even skated in six or seven months, you know? I was traveling um, across the United States with some buddies, and at that time I rode for Invisible. And we went through uh, Dallas, Texas, and I don't know how I even linked up with him, but I think I, I heard he lived in Dallas. Jamie was like, you got a board? I said, nah. And he hooked me up, he gave me an Invisible board, and um, took me to the skate shop and got some trucks, and yeah, I got a setup. We went skating that day, and it was just like, I was filming him and he was just seriously so good. It, like, at that time it was like, it was obvious he was way better than a lot of people, you know, and like he was definitely good enough to be sponsored by whoever. But he was just like hanging out with these like, like, like gangbanger dudes in Dallas, like super thug dudes that, they were super cool and stuff, but it was just a whole other life, you know. There was nothing about skating. Even though all the dudes in his clique used to skate and were skaters, they were kind of like more about, you know, kind of being like, thug hustlers and they were skaters, so. It was obvious that he didn't have a real stable situation going on. Like, he was, I think he was living with his dad at the time, but I don't even know if he was staying with his dad. He was probably, you know, maybe just 18 then. It, it was insane. Like, right then I was like, wow, this is like one of the best dudes I've ever seen skate. Like, he's like so good. All I know is, is we skated that weekend, and I filmed, I don't know, like two minutes of probably the best skateboarding I've ever done in my life to this day. I remember he filmed like a line that was like a minute long. It was like the most flat ground tricks I'd ever seen anybody do in a row before, and he did them all in a line. At that point, I was just like, hey man, I didn't even, I mean, I wasn't like running invisible or nothing, but I was just like, hey, if you want to ride for this company, I'm sure I can figure out a way to make it happen. I mean, he probably didn't even know in his mind if he was going to continue skating or not after I left. Keep going, bitch. But if he got free stuff showing up in the mail, he was either going to be able to skate it, sell it, whatever, it was going to be something. So um, I left, got home, and then lined up a package and started sending them stuff. Jamie called me up and he's, oh yeah, I forgot about this part. This is my very first tour. He called me up, he said, hey man, we're doing an invisible tour. Why don't you uh, jump, on the, jump in the van? It's okay. So I jumped on the van, but Jamie wasn't there. Jamie had quit invisible just as I was going on this invisible tour. So I went on the tour anyway. He went on the tour with those dudes and they just went trekking across the US. And then basically I called him when I got on Toy Machine. He was back in Dallas, basically Ed. Ed was like, hey man, you down to help me rebuild the team? And I was like, sure, you got any guys you want? And he's like, uh, no, not really, but um, if you want to figure something out or get some guys on the team, I'd be psyched. So I started with Kalis, basically. He was like one of the dudes. I went back to doing my Dallas, just, you know, kind of hood shit, skating a little bit. A couple months later, he, he got a hold of me and he's like, hey man, like, dudes are really fucking hyped on your footage. I guess, I don't know where he put it, but he was like, dude, if you can get out here, I'll let you live at my house. You just have to get out here. I mean, I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I mean, I, I made a little bit of money just hustling kids and betting on Mortal Kombat. And we had this dude who would work full-time job and me and my homie would just like take his check, you know, and pay ourselves. My dad told me 350 bucks for gas and he'd fly me out but he owned a, like one of them little Cessna planes, right? So I went to California on a Cessna airplane with nothing but what I was wearing. And touchdown, Jamie picked me up, then it moves on to the Riviera PB, 
Jamie Thomas, Alien House. Where do I hang out? I hang out at the Alien House because they drink 40s and play dominoes. And uh, it was tight. I lived in Pacific Beach at the time, and we just kind of lived in this like weird apartment in Pacific Beach. Yeah, he stayed with me for almost a year. At least it felt like a year. Yeah, yeah, it was a skate house, and we lived right across the street from the Alien Workshop house. That's how kind of that, those relationships started. But Yeah, the Alien house was right across the street, and it was right up my alley. I mean, it was like Clyde Singleton, Kelly Bird, Drake Jones, Lenny Kirk, and Rob Deerdick. I mean, all those guys were there, and it was dominoes, dice, 40s, and weed. And that's what I liked. So I hung out with them all the time. We lived in the most psycho party house that was like, not only was it like, you know, the whole alien team and Bokma and Weiss and just madness, like one of the craziest times of my entire life where not only did the four of us live there, but then we just, it was just absolute mayhem every single night, like chicks and rolling dice every night. It was like the most psycho skate house of all time. Now they had the party. They had the party house and they had chicks and stuff. You know, like it was like it was obvious. Like you know, I, I got it. I never really. I thought it was cool. Like you know, we were like skate homies. You know? And then he would go over and hang out at the alien house for like to get into like party scene and whatever. You know, smoking weed or cigarettes or whatever so it was cool I would go over there too sometimes and I, I wouldn't stay as long as Josh Josh would stay every night just like we lived like across the street so he would just walk back to my house at like 3 in the morning and then we'd go skate the next day and then after we were done skating at night we'd get some food together and then he'd go to the alien house and hang it and I would like I don't know hang out with a girl or watch a movie or something yeah. I had such a mellow lifestyle you know I was like whatever totally two different totally different worlds so basically he lived with me for like I don't know six months to a year and we made the heavy metal video and he was killing it in the heavy metal zone. And we were filming every day. We were just doing random lines in California, and it was sick. And we had a really good time at filming that part, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And he was skating so good, you know? He three-flipped the trash can off the smallest bump in the world. Like, basically, it was like a little ripple in the car parking lot and three-flipped straight over a trash can. At the time, it was, like, phenomenal. Like, nobody had seen that. I remember, like, when that came out, people were tripping. Just the way he did tricks, too, it was so proper and so, like, unique, you know? A few years later, I moved to SF, and he was there with Jamie right when they were filming for a Toy Machine video. And then I watched his part, and I was, I was tripping, like, on how, like, what an amazing skater he'd become from, like, that skate rat that I was chilling with trying to figure out how to shoot photos of, like, three, four years earlier, you know? It was crazy. Yeah, that's that's his switch crook. I remember he just filmed that like a day or two prior for his toy machine car. It was cool, but you know Jamie Jamie was always real cool and real nice. But he, I mean, he's a workhorse and he's got a different work ethic than me. I told you my work ethic is like I need to be enjoying what I do and having fun, and then then I'm then I'm a workhorse. Jamie wants to like make sure he goes and gets what he needs to get, you know what I mean? And I wasn't that dude, you know? Like, I like to hang out and work, and he liked to go to work, you know? And we just didn't click like that. Oh my gosh! You all right, man? Did you bump your middle? Oh my gosh! I mean, he lived with straight edge, like hardcore Jamie Thomas at Jamie Thomas's rawest, you know what I mean? Living in a little apartment in PB, like grinding, like, you know, like just building what he would, you know, later become. And like, you know, as much as Jamie had helped him and he just wasn't like that, you know? He, he just wasn't in that sort of mindset. He like played too many practical jokes on me, you know what I mean? Like I was kind of a, a serious dude who was just getting out of like being a tough guy. I just couldn't get down with it, you know? I couldn't get down with like 
Ed's crazy. I couldn't eat hamburgers in the house just because like he's this crazy vegetarian and the smell bothered him. So I had to eat outside all the time and I just, I just couldn't deal with it. We were two completely different people, you know? Basically he smoked and I, I used to buy him food but I wouldn't buy him cigarettes cause I was like kind of like straight edge dude or whatever at the time. And I um, just thought it was lame that like he had these addictions that I had to support. So I was just like refused to buy him cigarettes. So I, I swear he basically just would hustle me for cigarettes. He would like, he would ask me like, dude, if I do this trick and like this many tries, you give me a pack of cigarettes. And, so I would like bet him cigarettes for tricks. I remember one time he won a carton off me and he was so, so psyched. I asked him to three flip this flat gap. I told him I'd give him a carton of cigarettes if he made it like next try or something and he made it. And it was like, it was pretty gnarly at the time. What's up, fool? <laughs> oh, my cigarettes, boy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you gonna skate that good for cigarettes? <laughs> it's funny a lot of people would think that you wouldn't fit in with the like the toy machine vibe. Like you know what I mean? It's always like almost like trivia, like Josh Kales used to be on toy machine. Shit, I didn't fit in that. That's why I quit, <laughs> you know? Even when I met him, he was over toy machine. I remember going to his apartment and like I remember looking in his closet one time, you know, he was, we were in his room and he looked in his closet and he had like stacks of t-shirts, like stacks of toy machine t-shirts in plastic, like brand new. And I mean, to me, that was like a trip. I mean, I was like, wow, man, you know? And then he was just like, yeah, man, like that's all garbage. Like, you know what I mean? Like I ain't gonna ride for a toy machine. And I was just like thinking like, damn dude, like, God, I kind of want a t-shirt, but I don't want to ask for one. <laughs> I was now into going to San Francisco. I stayed with, with Drake Jones all the time and he was actually working out a little thing for me to get on real and I was riding real boards and like I was gonna ride for real 100 percent I, I kind of saw it coming though he moved to San Francisco and um, kind of just got a whole new crew and stuff and we started talking a little less and less you know he was still riding for toy machine but he was, he was wearing different shoes every time I saw him he was on flow for like three or four different shoe companies you know yeah. I think he felt like he fit in more at real, you know what I mean? Like like you said, like, you know, Toy Machine was, you know, Ed who was kind of artsy and quirky to himself, kind of about his whole vegan vibe. And I was, you know, hardcore skate focused. And I don't know, man, I, I, I can imagine why. I mean, I see the fit in, you know I mean? He, he felt like he fit in. And so the trade show came up and uh, Drake Jones came down and he was like, yo, Thebo and those guys, they're ready to do it right now. And I was like, that's what's up. Like, all right, I'm going to go quit Toy Machine right now, right this minute. And he was like, all right. So I'm walking down the ASR hallway, and I make a right, and I just bump face-to-face -face with Deerdick. And Deerdick was like, where are you going right now? And I was like, well, I'm going to quit Toy Machine. And he was like, for who? And I was like, before I could even say real, he's like, I'll, we'll cut you a check right now. And I was like, oh, shit. Let's do it. And that was it. I went and met Chris Carter, and he wrote me a check right there. I think it was like 250 bucks or some shit, you know? <laughs> and he was like, boop. It was really a mutual, like, oh, I'd love to ride for Alien, you know? I'd be, it'd be so sick if I was on, like, Alien Team. Like, you guys have so much fun. It's just, that'd be sick. I'd be like, dude, like, you're on. If you want to be on, you're on. Like, no, that don't say, really, though? <laughs> Be like, yeah, you're on, and that's really how it works. From that's how he works. Like he'd be like, oh, like say something, like how oh, sick, and like, yep, you're on, you know. Once I figured out that Alien was a real option, and I, you know, that's where I hung out with every day, you know, and I had to do it. I was like, fuck, those are my homies. Boom. Yeah, of course it was a bummer, man. I mean, I'd, I was, you know, like at any time when you like help somebody out and you like help them out of whatever situation they're in, and. I kind of was like the dude he leaned on for a long time, you know, like for emotional and financial support, like in every aspect, you know, and when you give like that, I mean, it obviously feels good to help somebody out, but if, you know, they're able to just break it off at like a moment's notice, it just, it feels kind of gnarly, you know, it's almost like you're in like a relationship or something. I mean, not to sound too sappy, but it was pretty, uh, it was pretty heavy. I remember being like pretty bummed, you know, like it, it rocked me for like a week or two, you know, like where I was just like lump in your throat, like. It sucks, you know. It was never really that weird between us, you know what I mean? I, I was a little bit butt hurt for a while, you know, but, you know what I mean, I got over it, you know. But when I'd see him, I'd always act like it was cool, even if I was, like, you know, a little bitter still. It was all right, man. I got over it, and, you know, we just moved on, and 
at any rate, um, I saw him like five years later. I came through Philly, and he like you know sat me down. Like you know we were like away from the you know the crew for a minute, and he's just like, man, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you helping me out back in the day. You know, and um, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be in skating right now. And I just kind of want you to know that, you know. And I was like, cool, man, thanks. You know. Yeah, I gotta I gotta give way more credit to to my dude Jamie Thomas, man. Like that dude made all this shit possible for me. He um. When he gave me the opportunity to come out here and like paid for me for six, eight months or whatever, you know, just for me to like turn around and quit the company that I rode for with him. I mean, that dude pretty much paved the whole way for me, man. It's like, I guess if I owe anyone in this shit, it would be him. You know what I mean? He's a good dude. <laughs> it would have been funny if you were in, in Welcome to Hell. Yeah, I think I just missed that one. I just missed Welcome to Hell. You know, actually, it was probably a good thing I missed Welcome to Hell because I had already broken both ankles and a foot by that time, and I just couldn't be a stair jumper or a rail jumper anymore. And I don't know what the hell I would have done if I would have stayed. And, <laughs> you know, Jamie takes me to the rail spot. It's like, oh, my God. What we didn't know at the time is how crazy wrapped out ghetto he really was because Jamie kind of cleaned him up, like no jewelry, like just kept him like, you know how Jamie does is like finds you and like turns you into a street soldier, you know, and he had just sort of cleaned him up, you know, to where when he finally quit to ride for Alien, his like inner hardcore like Dallas, Michigan ghetto side like exploded the moment he got on Alien, you know, we we're like, what the, what the hell? I mean, I was just coming out of that Dallas shit, you know? Tech Nine earrings and Tech Nine pinky rings, and I mean, we thought we were kind of doing it. <laughs> well, Alien at that time, though, was that way. I mean, it was basically like all those guys, like Cornrows and Cargos, and it was basically a full product of the 90s, you know? So all those dudes were into it, you know? Like, Kalis went back to Texas and filmed a lot of footage for his time code part, and, you know, he had Cargos throughout the whole thing and stuff. Despite Alien having that memory screen, sort of crazy artistic, you know, that set this new precedent in what video production even could be, us as a team, we were united in this sort of like more broad scope. Like we weren't all flowing around in artsy. We were all like listening to hip hop and it was sort of like a, a nice blend of the artists and the creation of, of what the brand was, but we all still sort of maintained the same sort of style and unity. Well, it wasn't overly hip hop, but it wasn't like rock or anything else, you know? And, and he fit into that really, really well at the time, you know? He was part of like the beginning of that like new guard for Alien at, at that particular time. Prepare to time code. Just Kalis. To tell you the truth, it had nothing to do with the image and art direction. It had to do with Rob Dyrdek, John Drake and Dwayne Petrie. And then Bo Turner was like one of the best dudes. You know what I mean? He was such a ball breaker. I just wanted to be a part of all that, you know? Dude, we never talked about videos, ever. I don't even know how Time Code came out. Like, I think Deerdick and maybe Mike Hill or somebody, I mean, they just took whatever footage people had and made a video. We weren't filming for a video. We weren't doing any of that stuff. They were just like, man, we got to put something out. You know, and at that time, he was just so raw. Nobody was putting it down in the streets harder than he was. It's like when he had the, the, um, the cover of Transworld doing the backside 180 with the Golden Gate Bridge in the back with the Adidas. And he was hot, yo. He was really, really hot. You know, me being out in California, in San Francisco and Josh being Josh and I was still hanging with little hood motherfuckers so he couldn't really hang with me like that like he could in Philly but when Josh came through it was it was still all love but you know as far as being competitive and having a good sponsor and having a whack sponsor and shooting with the right photographer and shooting with the wrong photographer and not having whatever to get to the next level Josh had it all it was something that you can model yourself after like damn I want to be like Josh I want 
I want to get the cover of Trans World. I want the DC this. I want to, you know, but you got to work for that shit. I was staying at Josh's house and I was wilding out. I was only 15, so I was like, I would be wilding, like throwing up, like just spilling shit, you know, getting caught stealing and running back in the crib, like just, just blowing the spot up. And then here comes Lenny Kirk. You know, I go into the crib and like this new dude sitting on a couch and he's like, yo, you got to leave. I'm like, shit, I don't got to go nowhere. My man live here. And Josh was like, yeah, you got to leave. And I was like, wow. So it was a real big fuck you to Lenny Kirk. But the, the powerful era that they had, you know what I mean? It wasn't about me. That's how I look at it now. It was like he ran hard with Lenny Kirk for a while. Well, when the time code stuff came out, I didn't hang out with anybody, but actually Lenny. <laughs> like me and Lenny were roommates in San Francisco. And like, I love Lenny because Lenny is crazy as shit. Before his Jesus stuff, he was like, so ghetto gangster, just like we were two peas in a pod. You know what I mean? He had his cornrows and his camos and I had my camos. And I mean, we just, we thought we were the hardest dudes ever, but Lenny would take it a little bit further than me. You know, when I think of Lenny, like how he skates, I think of that one photo where he's grinding this ledge in between a pool where his arm is like just so like rocketed out. Every time like his arm would be looking like he's fucking punching the air and he, I mean, he was just like so dope. I loved how he skated. Like I was jealous a lot of the times cause like I can't really jump off shit like he could, you know? He could do the, like the most tech shit or he could grind the most gnarliest shit. With Lenny, he's just such a rad dude to watch on a skateboard. That workshop pad, that grind out drop thing, you know, like he had to literally like pinned himself against the door and like ran and fucking threw his board down and it was, it was pretty raw, dude, it was sick. I just remember like thinking like, holy shit, this guy's insane. I was always a Lenny Kirk, you know, his, I was always a fan of his skating. His time code part, seriously, hands down my favorite video parts, like definitely in a top five. The song, the vibe, all the, his whole kit at that time was like untouchable. His skating was so sick and it's so raw. It was like, like I, I don't even know if anybody's ever even come out that raw. I mean, maybe Trainwreck, like maybe. That was that like uncut and like unfiltered. Lenny skating, it was identical to his personality. Oh, back in the day, Gangster Lenny days, he would roll up with like cornrows blasting gangster rap and he had like, I know he had this bat in the back seat of his car with like screws drilled into it. Like he really had like a spiked bat. Because I think he was listening to Wu Tang and you know he wanted to have a spiked bat, so And yeah, we were just you know driving around drunk, get on the house parties, starting fights, like I remember this one fight broke out in Houston and they ended up going back with like empty Snapple bottles they got from my from my room and like tor I think they torched a house in the middle of the night. We were at Denny's one time in San Diego. Some Marines were in there. So what's Lenny do? Like, like blah, blah, starts talking all that shit to him. Marines starts talking shit, about ready to fight. Lenny reaches under his fucking seat and pulls out a BB gun and cocks the BB gun to this Marine. Like, what's up now? Cocks a fucking BB gun. Well, here comes the Marine, grabs a hammer, like a, like a real hammer, not like a fucking gun hammer, and fucking bashes Lenny's car, punches him in the face, and here come all eight Marines out the thing. Lenny, let's fucking go, dude. But he was just like that, always drawing attention. And then he hit his head and like smoked weed and tripped out and fucking found God. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins always. Pray always, get to know the Lord. Study and obey the Bible. Quit sinning, escape hell. I've told that story so many times. It's always a good one to tell in vans. Because the story of Lenny Kirk, basically, you know, what happened to Lenny, you know? Well, I wasn't there when he grinded the dumpster and fell back and smacked his head, you know? But that's not what made him turn to religion. Um, either a few days before or a few days after that, he got ran over by a Pacific Bell truck. Like, full on from his ankle all the way up. And he didn't break a bone. And it was in front of mag skaters. Then... Uh, a couple days after that, he was skating across Haight Street 
in this Jeep, like, beep, honked the horn at him, and he must have ran a light or something. The guy in the Jeep was like, hey, boy, don't you see the light? And he was like, don't I fucking see the light? Like, whatever. Skated around, and then that night, he was hanging out with some chick, and he was smoking weed, and I guess he, he was telling me that he was thinking about the dude in the Jeep, don't you see the light? And fucking, bam. Like, he said he went sober, kicked the chick out, and then all that psychoness that he had went into religion. And next thing you know, before every time he tried a trick, he'd open up the Bible, read a verse, and that was going to be the outcome of the trick. In time code, he 50-50 grinds this, this long ledge. It's in a parking, on the top of a parking ramp, and it goes flat. And then he, you know, pops off onto the sidewalk. And while we were skating that thing, he fucking grinds his front truck comes off and he falls backwards and rolls and whap i mean he smacks his head so hard so i run over there to see if he's all right and he's praying and he's asking for forgiveness and he's apologizing and like when he was done praying i'm like yo dude like what are you praying what are you what are you apologizing for he's like man i jerked off this morning and that's my punishment so we start watching the footage right on the camera and he's like you see that you see that like he swore that he could see God's hand come down and boom, mush his head into the ground. And I was like, get the fuck out of here, right? And I, I had to deal with that every day until I just had to like completely separate myself. If you were wearing, like for me, I would, I would be wearing a necklace. And he'd be like, yo, Kalos, dude, you're going to hell. You're going to burn in hell for wearing that necklace. You represent a female. It was the most cockamamie, like jibber jabbish, like, you know, he spoke in tongues, you know, it was so all over the crazy map. I had this argument with him about Hubba Hideout and how he was gonna switch back tail it even though Kalis already did. You know, and I'm like, you can't do that. He's like, it don't matter. I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm like, you can. So he was doing a sermon for this church. There was probably 300 people there. He's just, you know, like, and I'd walk, I was in the gutter. I was like, wow, the days. And, you know, he's going, he's like, and I don't, I don't care who did what on what ledge or who did. <laughs> like, it turned into where he was focusing in on me, like, in the middle of the sermon, it just, he just somehow twitched into the memory of having the argument of a trick already being done. He got fixated on, like, a young girl in, like, a tight top, like, and you're dressing around like a whore, coming around, acting like a whore, and you think you could come around, put your body up, but I had to stop, I had to get up, be like, yo, dude, yo, and he's just like, oh. And people were saying to me, I can't believe that didn't move you. And I'm like, I, what? None of it even made sense. Like, like, the guy was just like, it's like, it was so crazy. And they were just like, oh. He has some pretty heavy, you know, mental stability issues that far outweigh anything that he wants to do. You know what I mean? He could want to be someone, but he's mentally not capable of being the person he wants to be. And I think that that, I mean, it's like, how do you avoid that? You know what I mean? Basically, I don't know if Carter was the dude who was helping Lenny or who was the dude, but somebody was giving Lenny a temporary platform to be, like, to have a normal life for a while, you know? And then once that kind of crumbled or fell apart or he, you know, burned the bridge, then he was out there on his own again, left to his own devices, and, you know, we all saw where that went, you know? It, it just became one of those things that, like, he really never skated after time code really ever again. Not only was he just being like so focused on all things God and, and preaching and you know spending you know being in the streets preaching that eventually they just they had no choice you know I mean in his brain he is a hundred percent right you know what I mean I heard he was robbing old ladies in Frisco so I call him up Lenny what are you doing dude robbing old ladies and he was like man it's tough times the Lord said it was all right I was like wow and it was shortly after that is when he got busted robbing that taxi cab driver and off to prison he went. I mean, I don't know the whole story. I just heard all the rumors about him walking around Pier 7 with a shotgun in his pants, you know? No, he got out after a few years, and I actually went to Frisco and skated with him for a week, every day, and he was killing it. Like, there's sick footage right now of Lenny, like, board sliding this flat rail. It was awesome skating with him. And next thing I know, I got a phone call from him from San Francisco jail. Like, hey, man, I, I need 20 grand like, for this lawyer. Like, what are you doing in there? He's like, I got seven charges, man. Allegedly, it was like kidnapping and some other crazy shit. I don't know. It's pretty wild. After he first went to jail, it was on 
September 10th. So he kept calling me over and over from jail, like, like, see, Rob, I told you, God, just put me in jail. It's, a, it's, it's a, the end times are here. The end times are here. And this would have been September 10th. 2001. The next day, 9/11 happened, so he was like, for sure, the end of the world. God put him in jail because of that. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it's pretty ridiculous. But the crazy thing is too is he went. Now he's like a vato. You know what I'm saying? Now he's like a Mexican gangster. Like, have you ever seen his MySpace? No. <laughs> Wow, where it's like, la vida loca, and it's like, fuck all, fuck all the bitches on my vida, my bitches in my loca, like whatever, it's like, looks like a Spanish gangbanger's MySpace page. It's incredible. living in Frisco at this point in time and my chick bounced went back to Michigan and I'm following her so I moved to Chicago right from Frisco just to be a little closer to see if I can keep that fire going right and uh, I say hey why don't we go to Philly you know she's like all right so her and her friend we got in a car and we drove to Philadelphia me and a couple dudes went to go get some weed. And so I told her to meet me at Love. And uh, when we got back to Love, her and her friend were like bugged out. We were like, what's, what's going on? She's like, you see those fucking guys over there? And there was like seven or eight dudes. And she's like, yeah, they were fucking pulling their dicks out and like giving us a hard time, her and her girlfriend. So Stevie was like, what, what dudes? I had a lot of homies that would rob a lot of people that came to Love Park, you know? Yeah. So we chilling at Love Park one day and my man was about to rob Josh. And I was like, no, 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 he cool, he cool, don't worry about him, like, he good. You know, when Josh came over to sit down, I introduced him to everybody, and he was like, damn, it ain't, like, where's everybody at? I'm like, no, this is our park now. The dudes had knives in their backpack, and Stevie and them fucking took their knives off them, and like, the fuck out of here. So, Olivia saw that, like, brotherhood, you know what I mean? She was like, damn, these are your dogs, man. Like, yeah, I'm down to move back. And your daughter is with her? Yes, yeah, that's my baby mama. Hey. Mommy, mommy and daughter, right there. Coming to theaters. Film over sweet, that's Yeah, yeah, bring on. He's a good dad. They lived up the street from love. They lived like six, seven blocks away. So Olivia would come down with, with Jalen every now and then. I have tons of footage of her down there. Of course, brings them right to the love. <laughs> she's probably like a few months old here, if that, and now she's like 11 now. So I think she was born in 99. She fell in love with it because I fell in love with it. I mean, I, I used to skate Philly before then, but this time it was like, wow, I mean, it's not very many people are skating. I ran into Stevie who was like fucked up in a bus stop. And I was like, man, this is where I want to be. I was in the train station drinking a 40 with my man on the corner <clears throat> and Josh pops up like, like basically like, yo, I got an apartment here. I want you to live with me. And I'm like, yeah, right. But he was serious. And he was like, damn, I wish you skated a little bit more. And I was like, I don't, you know what I mean? I'm here every day but I don't skate no more, really. So you had already quit profile and all that shit? Right? I have shit, yeah. So I quit you, everything. You quit no, I got kicked off everything, you basically, yeah. Because oh, okay. I was wildin', like, I was like just some street nigga that just didn't really take my skill serious, and it took Josh to, like, smack me in the head, like, though, yo, you... And I'm seeing, staying with him, he getting big-ass boxes of DCs and free shit, he got all this money next to everything. Every time I turn around, he's buying a new car, and I didn't even have a license. And he knew that, but he just wanted to make sure that I was situated and I maximized the potential that I had. And that's why I love him, you know, that's, that's my heart right there. Ah, nasty. Go, go, go. And he helped me get back skating by battling me. And like I said, it's somebody that knows you that could pull your skill out of you and actually see you shine. And, you know, I give Josh a lot of credit for 
the rebirth of my career. Growing up there, that's who any kid in that area looked up to, you know what I mean? Like I would go skating and I wouldn't have any laces in my shoes, you know what I mean? Like, and tongues would be out and, it, you know, we were all, anybody that said that was from that area and that said they weren't a huge Stevie Williams fan is a goddamn liar. And he was so Philadelphia, you know what I mean? That like, it like, you could see it just like pouring out of him, you know? Uh, Josh at Love Park and Stevie at Love Park, yeah, those were the days. And I remember like rolling up there with Josh and being cool with Stevie right away and like, yeah, seeing that whole era go down was definitely like one of the best scenes in skateboarding ever. Just like plaza in the city, locals everywhere, like super fun to skate, like the best stuff you can imagine to skate and these two kids just ruling it. You know, that was right around the time I, you know, my back was out. I couldn't skate for a long time. And that's, you know, when, when those two started blowing up love on their, on, on their level, you know, was around that time period. After the Eastern Exposure, you know, Ricky's movement and, and that whole crew of people, it was fading out. And then Josh just, just revamped the whole thing, him and Stevie. And then that brought, you know, more light to the O'Connors and the Plahowskis and the Papalardos and Wennings and stuff. You know, like he really brought together this movement. You know, they were all teammates, you know, whether it was DC or the workshop. And Josh was always just so prominent there, you know. It was like always filming something super hard, always like just, you know, he's killing it, man. Dude skated really fast and did really hard tricks and was super unique and like, you know, it was always super consistent, you know, the same way he skates now is just as hard as he shredded, shredded back then, you know. Yeah. At the time there wasn't, you know, a skateboarder, a pro at the time that me being like a little hip hop honky was like more identifiable with than Josh Kalis, you know. The, the raddest thing was there wasn't a kid that came downtown that didn't have some DCs on with swooshy pants and a fucking DC jersey or a workshop t-shirt and every kid, you know? It turned into a thing when Josh started like skating a lot, like real hard and like wanted to film all the time, take photos all the time. And then a lot of people started wanting to come to, like a lot of people wanted to come to Philly. There was just so many people. Like it went from like not many at all to like uh, so many that it was like, I was filming all day long and then like go out at night with generators, but I wanted to, I liked it. Everyone wanted to do it. We knew that something was going on and we wanted to keep it going and we wanted to make it bigger. Come on, put the board down. Team it. Board down. We gotta get on shit. You broke up another Brian board. Brian Winning. I knew How many boards you got at the house, Brian? Zero. You got three. You got three things? He sent them three boards. Welcome to the team. I look like a sucker because I fucked, I fucked up, but I'm going to get him now. <laughs> Brian and Anthony were here every day, like doing stuff, so it was like, that. everyone was doing stuff. Well, if I wasn't filming somebody do something here, I was filming somebody do something over there. I was here every single day, every single day. Skate down here and I would just hang out with everyone. It was wild. And there's a lot of people that were there that no one will ever know that were like the staples. I'd rather see them skateboard than running around trying to stab somebody, trying to take something from somebody. But there's a whole cast of characters that made up that place. Beat Nick. Hey man, I used to skate. You remember when you used to hey, see me out man. here? I used to skate hard as shit before. I, that's when I didn't know you. I used to do acid. Hey look. Hey, yo, was you out here when I tried to on 5 all that? I swear I had that shit spark and I could never land it. I like, you've seen, you know, Stevie and Josh and all these guys. There was a crew of hoodlums and there was a crew of, like, yeah, derelicts, just like bombs that bombs. bone. And there was, like, also the cops were part of it. And then we, you know, Josh knew all the undercovers. He was so boys with them. Like, they, he would give them his shoe. You would hear stories like Josh ran into the undercovers on South Street and he went and took them all to Elite and put DCs on all of her feet. So they would run in and you'd be like, 
I remember sitting there one day like, why is this guy not even running? You know, I'm freaking out. Like here he had like all the undercovers in his pocket. They all had his shoes on. These are um, the shoes I skated in with Chomp on this. So remember these? <laughs> I remember and I, I was just so proud of that video part. I'm like, dude, I'm gonna keep these shoes. Like Josh's shoes are so sick. I think these were Stevie's. That was that era for Josh and Stevie. It was a black, white, combo, you know, everybody know he looked out for me. And me and him had DC that made us, put us on that pedestal. This is right when Kalis and Stevie were both getting their shoes out for DC. And so like, at the time they both lived in Philly, so I would go out there in 99 and 2000, pretty much the whole summer I'd spent at Love Park. So this is just a photo from the first summer I really spent a lot of time out there, it was in 99. Like Should we go to Love Park? They, and the thing is, is Josh and Stevie, they really, they combined their skill with that symbol and made something I don't think I'll ever see again in skating, uh, as for a long time at least. <laughs> but like it was everything. It was like the board had the love sign on it. And then there was a photo with everyone in front of the love sign. It's like you, you do that and then people from all over the world, all of a sudden people from Germany are showing up to skate there. And like from all over, it's like an, an attractive spot. And at that time, I was going to New York every weekend to skate with RB because, like, the weekend warriors would come to love. It'd be like a hundred kids. Came to visit me in New York one time, and I remember people were like clowning me for like meeting up with Josh. <laughs> like, oh, why are you filming him? Man, you should be filming the guys from New York. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's Josh. He's my boy from Texas. Like, I'm gonna film him. You know, it was really easy to film with Josh. Like, he's always he always just like did something good and never really took that long of a time for me, you know? Because I was used to filming like certain skaters for a long time, like lucky to get like going back every day for a trick and l luckily getting like one trick a week of this guy. But with Josh, it was super organic. We'd just go to a spot and be like, oh, I, I want to try this, I want to try that. And it always came out dope, you know? And then I think, I don't know if it was in Heads or if it was in, uh, I think it might have been in, in Photosynthesis maybe, but he did a line at Newport with just a fakie flip on flat. And I just remember this fakie flip he did on flat was, I was like, yeah, that's how you fakie flip. You gotta fakie flip like you mean it. This one time I went to Josh's, uh, I went to his mother's house out in, where is it, out in Pennsylvania? Yeah, near, um, in Pennsylvania? near like Sesame Place. Or... I went out there and he was skating on a, he had a board on a trampoline. Have you ever seen him yeah, do yeah, that? Yeah, that trampoline. He's, have you ever yeah. seen him do the board yeah. on the trampoline? Yeah, it's it's psycho. Yeah. He can do like every trick variation. It's, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I feel like when he Warm skates, up. when he skates, he does those tricks like he's bouncing off the trampoline. It's like he ollies and then taps it in, like in the littlest parts and it will like flip the right way. The cans, like the bump over the trash cans. You know, the tricks that he did over them were like unfathomable. Like how do you even pop your board over that thing? First of all, like if you fall, those trash cans aren't giving at all. Speaking of Rick, I remember one day saying to Josh, like, dude, you own those trash cans. And he goes, no, Jimmy, like that's not me. You know, Rick set that off and I just kind of like followed suit, you know? I think that he was so stoked on Ricky's thing that he's like, dude, I want to do stuff over those, over those things. Yeah. I mean, that is the, that is one of the things about and those, love. You would have to like pry those fucking tiles up. Yeah, they're and, so hard. And like, you would have like three, four kids sticking their boards in the crack on each side and prying it. And then it would get up. And as soon as it got up, kids would sit down and wait and just watch yeah. us. You would go over it. This is love part. <laughs> this is some funny ass shit, this story. So when Love like got the fence put around it and they shut the fucking place down, this crackhead used to come in front of my house. He'd knock on the door and be like, hey, you need your fucking sidewalk swept for a buck or something? I was like, I tell you what, man. I give you a thousand bucks if you go over there and get me one of them tiles. It's got to be an original, either the maroon or the gray. And he was like, consider it done. Three days later, fucking <laughs> dude had it in the shopping cart. I was like, what? How the fuck did you get that? He's like, that's my problem. Fucking drove him to the bank, took out a G, boom. Whose signatures are those? Those are like uh, probably Rasul or Jason or something like that. 
He told me never to come back in here, even though this is a public park. Hey, Kalis. They were always stiff on skating downtown, but they kind of like tolerated it. And then it got so bad. And then when they put the fences up and remodeled and everything, you know, it was like they just stuck a knife right into like the lung of the skateboard community, you know, it just, shit just deflated, you know. But you could just walk in that place and like, you like tingled, you know what I mean? Like you, you, it just made you skate better being there, you know. I remember being there a couple of years afterwards and being like, fuck man, this is like difficult. What, what happened? Like there used to, we used to have so much life down here and now it's like super depressing. I remember being young, being like bummed, like, oh man, these guys just come to the city and then they fucking move like, you know, when I got older, I understood, like, yeah, you got to keep it moving, you know, you got to go to another. So that's why Plahowski and Popular, these guys took off and went to other cities, you know. The downtown style culture seems dead. Like, nobody gives a shit about going downtown because they don't want to, I don't know if it's they don't want to deal with it or there just isn't as many, like, inner city kids. I, I don't know what the deal is, but um, in Barcelona, it's like still city vibe, you know. The first time I went, to Sans, because Mokba is cool, but it's like the tourist spot. Sans was more like the, you know, they had their squad. And they, when I got there, it was spray painted on the wall that said, go home. And I knew the story behind go home. And it was talking about Americans, like fucking quit coming here and filming. So like, I went there and I fucking introduced myself and they were all sitting on their table. I was like, hey, what's up, I'm Josh, man. Like, you know, give a shit if I skate around for a little while, do you? Maybe film some shit. And they were like, Raul. He says in some super broken English, he was like, Josh, you are a plaza skater and we are plaza skaters. Like, feel free. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? So I felt welcome and they welcomed me in like that. Coolest dudes, man. Coolest dudes. And Ruben Garcia, you know, he's like the fucking man over there, you know? The vibe is like, late 90s, US vibe, plaza vibe, like city vibe. You hang out all day in one spot. And the reason why you filmed it is because like, or the reason why I filmed it is because I just loved the day. I love being with my friends. I love the spot. I'm gonna film on it. It's kind of hard to explain. It's more of just a feeling. And that's the kind of feeling that I like to skate with. I like to film the more the merrier. If I go to the spot with 10 dudes and get kicked out in five minutes, I'd rather do that than like go on secret missions just so I can like try to get this trick. Like I don't, I don't really dig that, you know? And that's kind of how, at least in the pro skating world, it's gone. It's been like that for a few years. And Spain is just like to get away from that. I don't give a shit if my footage doesn't look as good. I don't care if it's not like with the best a-list filmer and all that shit. Like, I really don't care. If I'm with my homies, and we're having a good time, and everyone's skating, I wanna, that's what I wanna film. I wanna be a part of that shit, you know? He's truly lived in all of like the true skate meccas for pure street skating, you know what I mean? Like not, no one else has done that. When SF was cracking, he moved to SF. You know what I mean? When Philly was like resurging, he moved to Philly and blew Philly up. When Love Park went down, then he made the, the movement to spending, you know, six months a year in Barcelona and then he, he desperately tried to turn Chicago into Philly. That didn't, didn't work out so hard. And it, like, he is pure of wake up in your house and go skate raw street. And a lot of people can't say that. And, and he never followed trends and he'll hate on, he hated on every trend as it came and went, you know, and talked about how whack it was. I don't even like that. I'm like, that shit's hard to do. Like, it ain't hard to do, that's just whack. And went through it all, you know, and it's like one of the purest pure street skateboarding careers like there's no like he didn't have gimmicks and video parts he didn't you know there was 
no gimmicks and ads. You're gonna look at his footage from like whatever year that was in like 98 till this year and it's gonna, it will, it will seamlessly blend together. His pants might have gotten, his shirts might have gotten a shade tighter, but all that footage would have just blended together for, for his 15 year career, you know. You see, it's so weird because it's like, to me, he's still on Alien. You know what I mean? Like, he's such my, my, one of my very best friends in the world. I know him so well. I talk to him about everything nonstop. My advice to him every single time was, you're not me, man. Like, do not waste your time and a headache of trying to start companies and do this other stuff. It's not worth it. Like, you are a skater. Just skate. Come on, Derek, do this right now. First. You think he knows who you are? Just say Rob Derek. What's up? That, that's what I'm saying. I know. Give it to me, man. Need a dick comes back. <laughs> now then, at the end of the year, his following next year's contract will be fifteen hundred dollars with an option to buy out. So it's eighteen thousand. You have the option to say buy it out for six thousand. It's always dangerous to, to cross that line for these athletes, you know what I mean? Like, especially the, the urban skateboard image, I mean, that, that can flow into the cities like nobody's business, you know what I mean? And that's why he gets paid so much, you know, that's why he has the, he's the, the feature pro on DC's new shoe line, you know what I mean? Okay, great, good talk, you take care now. Alright. <laughs> oh, Dude, I just sealed the deal so gnarly. Like, like he was just like, well, I understand that. Like, if you could please give me that, if you can give me that in writing with the proposal in writing, if you can explain to me, like, how coming into this market, what you need to be, like, if you could just explain it to me, how, I mean, like, I, like, if we could take the powers to be, I know we can make it happen. Like, if we can make it happen like that. I was like, alright. Do you remember the name you told him? <laughs> Mike John Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson. Mark, <laughs> I better write that down. We will Freddie better Woo! This is Fred Now, like me and Deerdick got Ave on. I, I saw Ave's uh, Wheels of Fortune and was like, holy fuck, dude. This kid Nolly crooked grind and picnic tables like on flat ground, you know, and like switch front crooking. And I mean he was gnarly. He was like doing all the tricks that I either was doing to a gnarlier, bigger level, or that I wanted to do, and he was already on this crazy other level, and I was just like, fuck, Abe is so dope. Well, I feel like the workshop was always known to like not have people living by each other, but everyone clicked, and everyone got along, and when we hung out or went on a road trip, or like, I mean, it was mad fun. But it's not as personal anymore, like it's not as, friendly, you know what I mean? Shit, I would go on a road trip and not even know who to talk to anymore, you know? It's like, fuck, man, kind of lone wolf. I understood his position. When that new tier was sort of being rebuilt again, he just lost his voice in that, you know? And, and I think for him, as he became more and more alienated, so to speak, I, I, it just started to wear him out. Did you disagree with anything that Dill or Bill said in the Dylan's episode? Well, I, he used the wrong word, because upriver is usually like fucking in jail. Upstream. Okay, yeah. Say. Upstream, downstream. But I don't know what he was getting at, you know what I'm saying? Because he said, when I left the workshop, it became less upstream or upriver. To tell you the truth, if anything, I think it's a little bit more uptight now. You know what I mean? And I'm not really the, like the uptight dude, you know? And so I left a company that I thought was getting like more uptight, more focused on fashion and accessories. And, you know, I, I'm just not really a part of that. Like, I'm not with that. Like, you can tell in my video or in my video part, it's completely different than the rest of the video. You know, they're, they're going on their way and they're like, you know, whatever type of music that those dudes are going for in their direction, and just like, oh, that's not me, you know? It's so funny because, like, I called Dill, and, like, I'm like, You're like, dude, it's like, what, dude, I don't even like, and I'm like, dude, what, what do you, I'm like, what does upriver mean? He's like, and I'm like, I'm like, how can you, he's like, you know, where the fishing's good. And I'm like, like, how are you going to put, you know, and my whole thing is this, is 
Dill, it, Dill's just, you know, spatting off. Me and Bear are up river. You know what I'm saying? Kalis is not. You know what I mean? It's like, and even like, even like, telling Kalis like that. He just, it was just him. Cut, like your name got accidentally put in there. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, me and Bear are like TV and fucking website. You know, like me and Bear are like so far gone. Like it makes sense for being up river. Like he just accidentally put your name in there. It doesn't even feel like shit talking. You know what I'm saying? It, it's just Kalis doesn't want to hear his name. You don't want to be lumped in with me and Barra. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you don't. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, if you were fringe close to me and Barra, maybe. But, like, he's a, he's a purist. You know what I mean? Like, our problem with Kalis, DC video, Alien video, you name it video. He's done a year before everybody. Like, crying about, like, where a deadline's coming, we're losing our minds, paranoid, like, freaked out, like, hopefully we push this thing, like, and he's, like, got nine minutes of footage, and he's mad about, like, something being cut out, you know, and he's also a dude that's on the slap message boards, like, all day, like, he's a, you know what I mean, like, he's, he's in it, man, he, 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 like, he's in it with the shops, he's in it on the message boards, he's in it with, like, anyone that wants to talk about it, he'll break down, he'll hate, He'll come around, you know what I'm saying? It, he is a skate rat. Like, I feel like, shit, I rode for the workshop for 13 years. Like, I know the Alien Workshop. I know it. Like, I live it. And it just wasn't there anymore. To me, I, I realized that there was nothing personal about it. Even though I had a personal relationship with the owner, you know, or Deer Dick, there was nothing personal about my position at the workshop. And I just kind of felt like I was floating, doing nothing. There's no personal graphic. There's none of that stuff, you know? It's kind of over it. Uh, six months before I quit workshop, me and Mark Appleyard were actually toying with doing our own board company. And, I mean, the only thing we didn't have was a name. I mean, there was people ready to do it, you know? And me and Apple's like, we were going to have our, our own shit. But then what happened was, is Apple's wasn't ready to like take on the responsibility. He just didn't want to, you know. And I, and I, I get it. I'm, I'll take on responsibility. I don't give a shit. But it just ended up not working out. So I was talking to Stevie about it one day. And I was like, yeah, man, you know, me and Mark are talking about, been talking about doing the company for a while. Um, but I'm not sure if we're really going to do it. So I don't really know what I don't, I don't know what I want to do. I'm like, I don't really want to ride for the workshop anymore. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And then uh, he was like, damn, yo, maybe we should do something, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, actually, you know what, bro? Why don't you put an old fucking original DGK homie, white boy, on DGK? And he was like, who? I was like, come on, dog, you know what I'm talking about. He was like, say the word. Let's go. I was like, that's what you want to do? He was like, yeah, fuck it. I was like, how much you want? He told me, and it wasn't even a question. It was just, let's go. I thought that was really something that me and Josh both deserve. I think it's really, really cool on my end for me to own a company and have the person that saved my career skate for, the, for my company. So I don't really look at it like it's my company. I look at it like it's a situation that was put in front of us through the, through the grace of God. Everybody knows the story. Everybody knows that I came from shit and Kalis hooked it up. And for me to get laughed at for doing a company that people said wouldn't work and for it to be so successful that my mentor skates for it, it's priceless. It wasn't even, Josh could have said I want 20,000 a month and it still wouldn't have mattered because it's, it's a priceless, epic situation that you can't buy that shit. It's just, it's crazy, yo. And that's my man, yo. He got my heart. Everybody don't get on the team like that. And he gets a nice check, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So. He reps it pretty hard. Yeah, well, that's the deal. Like, it's not so much, I don't be like, Josh, you got it. I don't, still really don't even talk to Josh that much on the phone, because he like my brother, you know? Mm -hmm. But what I tell, the, the people on the team, and I tell them, like, look, he's going to show you the ultimate professionalism. Josh is the professionalism of 
skateboarding. He knows how to attack everything. He knows about this trick. He knows about every goddamn thing I don't know about. But if I'm not on tour and an Amazon tour like Marquise or Dwayne or things like that, they can act a legend pro like Kalis of how to handle shit, bank accounts to tricks to how to handle demos. He's a pro to look at to model yourself after of doing an excellent job in your career. It might sound dumb or old school or something, but like respect is so important to me. All through the 90s and even 80s, and I mean, it's always been that you didn't have to be like physically the best skateboarder, you know? Like, of course, there's always people who are better and more consistent or whatever, but when you build like a form of respect around you, people accept you and they bring that in and they want to like earn your respect, you know? It's, it's all about respect, man. Tray bomb, 360 flip, good day or bad day? Oh! <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy to look back 20 years and, you know, to think like Josh is kind of the, my, my friend's kid brother's friend, you know, 14 and goofy or whatever. And Josh was always like a really hyper kid. Like he was like jumping off the walls, like ready to go skate or like, you know, so-and-so's here, and so I'm gonna go do this. And so you could see kind of that like cocky, like punk ass kid edge or whatever. I say that in a loving way, but you know, that's I think one of the reasons Josh is where he is. <laughs> Josh. Good job, Josh. Good job. Hey, Josh, be proud of yourself. That was great. Hey, be strong, Do man. It. Be that strong. Was good disco maneuver. And now look at not only has Josh stayed relevant and grown with his career, but the whole industry has changed, obviously, so dramatically, and he's really been able to, to ride that and do his thing, and it's rad. You know, it's so cool. I'm proud of him. So, I don't know, it's funny, it's like one of those things when his career really started kind of ramping up and I remember thinking like, I hope this really works for him because he's one of those guys that, I, you know, I mean, it's rad, but I don't know what else he'd be doing if he wasn't skating, you know? What do you think you're gonna do? Like, how much longer do you think you'll be a pro or skate or whatever? I don't know, man. I'm definitely not one that would sit there and milk it, but, I'm definitely not one that's like ready to stop. I don't know, it's kind of tough to think about because I've been living the same lifestyle for 10, 12 years and I'm a high school dropout, man. I really don't know what could um, take place of skateboarding for me. Financially, mentally, like I, I really have no idea. Who knows, man, who knows, but I don't know, Patrick. I ain't even thinking about that shit right now, buddy. <laughs> Fucking sunset is setting. <laughs> I'm going to Atlanta tomorrow to skate in the new DGK uh, private park called the Playground, and that shit's going to be tight. Thanks, Josh. You want to head back? <laughs> <laughs>